We are here to bring you everything and anything surrounding Porsche. I'm Mike. I'm Aaron. And this is P Car Talk. Welcome to another podcast. My name is Mike. And I'm Aaron. This is P Car Talk. And we are on location at Aaron's house because his car is out of commission. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> well, I mean, I might have been able to make it. It's holding, the tire's holding more air than it initially. Yeah. Look like it, but then the uh, the oil filler is definitely not holding, or not sealing. Yeah, not so I thought it was not holding oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, no. Um, I ran. Did I run it without the? At least started it without the cap and stuff on. Yeah, it's not really spinning anywhere. I don't know how it would be if I was actually to journey. Yeah, no need to risk it. Yeah, sounds cool though. Like <laughs> if it's looking for more air and just shoving it all in there. And bah, 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 bah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's why we're not in the studio. So I came to Aaron uh, so we could go ahead and knock out a studio couple podcasts. B. Yeah, backup studio, always be on point. But uh, let's get rolling. So we have a new sponsor for the show, Rensport Adventures. Yeah, or, Talk, or, or RSA. Is RSA, like yeah. RSA is really cool. It's a cool name, right? Like yep. almost RS America, but uh, Rensport Adventures. Why don't you tell them a little bit about what Rensport Adventures does for people? So if you like to do car things and you like to do them in other places, like... Nürburgring, Spa, Munich, Frankfurt, any of those places. It's a seamless trip. So you say, okay, I've always wanted to go do this. I want to go to the ring. I want to see the Porsche Museum. I want to do other vacation things in between. Let's do it. Well, I don't want to plan that, or I don't want to do that. You know, I don't want to set up the hotels. I don't want to figure out where to eat. That's what this solves. Okay. solves all that, so awesome one one stop I've, shop. I've haven't been to i'm going to take them up on this i want to definitely take a trip so how do the listeners and everybody out there kind of go seek out more information where do they need to go for that so yeah to, to well you can look and see the there's some pictures and stuff but they have an instagram so that's Rensport mm. adventures okay and then the website rensportadventures.com okay so go to the website mm-hmm. and then they can do booking they can book trips if they want and all yep. that kind of stuff through there and see what the packages mm-hmm. are available to make that european travel and that dream vacation essentially come yep. to, come to life there's like a light itinerary for for like kind of the days and how long it is and then i know that once you actually book you get a full like a super detailed day one is this you're gonna go here here, here that type of thing okay what so and it's also th- this uh, group of people have kind of catered towards thinking of a couple right not just where yeah, it's that's not just a it bro trip be. because <laughs> yeah. as, as most of us know that yeah. um you know is with somebody else fortunately i don't have that problem but yeah. i'm sure like in aaron's situation his wife would not only want to just do car things as well when she's in europe she wants to see some like other sites as well and yeah. that's encompassed in with some of these trips too, exactly. right there's some flexibility with that right yeah there's i mean you can customize it it's not a hard set thing a lot of these are just like hey this is what has happened for this is what's been done as far as a set thing set thing and we know fly in here, go here, here, and here. It makes that experience easy. Makes everything you think about travel and it being difficult in other countries mm-hmm. a breeze. So there you go, guys. It's an easier sell for, to your lady friend. Yeah. Um, the approval because system. Because it's be not easy. just going to be a bro trip. And I know there's probably a lot of you listening where she's like, I'm not going on that. And you're not going either because it's going to cost X amount of dollars. And I'm not just going to see cars <laughs> the whole time. Well, yeah. And even if you're a like not a track guy, but you like track stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what the the road tours are for. So yeah. you get to learn so about the track. You can still get in a car, right? Yeah, and you're drive in a car. Around you Europe. get to pick what you want, and then drive around and get to learn about the tracks and stuff like that. And then there are other things where they do. It's not even learning about the tracks; it's different castles. Yeah, Aaron was telling me offline a little bit about these guys in the sense of like, really can do whatever you want. If you're a golfer and you like cars, you can. There's golf courses yep. where they can set you up with a round of golf, and my wife is in the spa where you're playing golf or whatever. You can go to a winery. You know, you can see racing, you can mix and match, you can do a little mm-hmm. bit of everything and you can basically make it your dream car slash family European trip, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, big shout out to uh, Rensport Adventures. Thanks for sponsoring the show. Um, next thing, next topic. EMSA has announced that they're back in business as far as going to start racing again. Yeah. Um, as soon as July 4th weekend, they're going to have a race. Which is crazy that they've already put a like... I mean, I'm, I'm sure they were just wait, just really want to put out a schedule. Yeah, and um, most of like, if you look at the schedule, go go to their website and just I'm paraphrasing for everybody who's listening. They crammed a lot of the WEC races like back to back to back to back mm-hmm. to back to back to back. Um, and what I mean by that is, literally, if you go down the schedule and you look at it, there's probably like eight races. You know, they're not back to back weekends, but they are pretty close and they're all over the place. So WEC's trying to get their their season in, regardless. Yeah. Um, 
which is more feasible because it's not a really, really wrong, long race. You got two hours and 40 minutes. You're pretty much racing it for that as yeah. opposed to the endurance side of, um, the EMSA cup side. Uh, we are still getting some of those enduro races. Mm-hmm. Um, they're going to do Watkins Glen. Yep. They're going to do road Atlanta and then they're going to do Sebring. Those are the yeah. three left for the year. Um, they're going to be towards the end of the year. Uh, road Atlanta still happening in October yeah, as gonna, scheduled. PT be, Le Mans, as almost, you guys almost know, the whole it. race season for us. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. Essentially, if you look at their schedule, the, there's only four endurance races on the schedule. It was Daytona at the beginning of the year before all this craziness happened. Mm-hmm. We had, we were able to go to that race. Then they'll, the next one is coming up is going to be Watkins Glen. We won't be going to that mm-hmm. one, but after that'll be road Atlanta. And then they final they finalize at Sebring, which we'll be at as well, um, in November. So we're going to bag three or the four endurance races of this year indirectly, yeah. lucky for us, you know, indirectly bad for the, uh, the season. Mm-hmm. But I'm glad at least, even though it's an abbreviated season, they're still having a season, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, you would, I guess you would want to, I mean, you have to appease the sponsorship at some, some level. Mm-hmm. So I'm sure they looked at them like, okay, what are, what's the best we can do here? Well, I think too, I think it was probably twofold. Obviously money is always a driving factor. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side of that, I think it's goes back to driver sharpness too, yeah. because if you have these guys out of a car for an entire season until maybe, so let's say they held them all the way to January till the next race, basically in mm. Daytona happens, um, how sharp would they really be? You, Is you a skill set going to not going to do it. Yeah. I don't know. Um, I'm sure it helps, yeah. but I don't think it's still not the same. And those guys will probably tell you too, mm. it's not the same. Uh, there's a lot of things still can go wrong with the car, with the balancing and all that stuff. And also sim racing doesn't help the crew get faster. Uh, that's true. I mean, I know there's a lot of, I know they're practicing. Don't get me wrong. It's not mm. like they're just sitting around doing nothing. Oh, they're, yeah. they're practicing, but it's still that game time mentality. Like you can practice to death, but until it's game time, to it's it's still really yeah. different to knock the rust off when you're actually doing the thing. Mm. Um, so I'm thankful that they're having it. I'm glad they announced it. Um, as far as the racing fans go, I know they said the first few races that were going to be spectator free. Mm. Um, so they weren't going to allow any spectators, but I think after two, I, I, I read, I think I read two or three races after, and that's basically did two or three WEC races. I believe they're going to start allowing spectators in, I think. Yeah. They, they probably gave, gave themselves a little bit of a buffer. Yeah, to just kind of see how, how it's going to go. Be in everywhere. Yeah, yeah, because it's uncharted territory. Mm-hmm. A lot of these sporting events and these large gatherings have never had to do anything where they they have an event with nobody attending. Yeah. And, and not for lack of because they wanted it, because they were regulated and not allowed to have them. That's so right. um, it's definitely going to be a unique thing. So obviously there's probably going to be a lot of people watching on TV. Needless to say, right? oh yeah, including or us. online or you know, yeah, yeah, well, however they can get yeah. it, which is, you know, at least it's on, I guess, and at least it's coming back around. And who knows, you know, there's so many talks, and you know, I don't want to dive down the wormhole because everybody's been inundated and getting crushed by this whole COVID thing and lockdown, and you know, they're expecting another round of it to happen in the winter time. And fingers crossed, hopefully yeah. it doesn't happen because if that does happen, it could delay the beginning of season 2021 because that you know uh daytona starts in january Mm -hmm. if this spikes again what happens to daytona the kickoff race like that's the big race obviously to start the season Uh, and then obviously you have le mans you know part of the race um which is not included in this year they're totally just off the books altogether which is sad in its own way um yeah so anyways Enough about that. <laughs> like sad moment. Yeah. Oh. Enough about the sad crap. That's not what we're here to talk about. Let's talk about Farron. We yeah. haven't talked about that in a while. As a reminder for everybody, that's still on because it Do looks like things are starting to come around. August. Right? Yeah. Club drive. Um, it's still happening. Um, everybody who's attending, all the club members got the revised dates. It's what, the third week in August when mm-hmm. it's happening? Yeah. And it's happening in a mountain range. And we're going to, we're super excited to have it. It's going to be our first one. Um, despite, you know what's going on in the country i think actually everybody will be very excited to go because it'll <laughs> give it an opportunity yeah. to do something and get out and so all you guys that were kind of holding back even before all this stuff started didn't realize what it was going to be this is a great opportunity as almost like a second lease for you guys for an opportunity to become a member and go on the fair and drive that's happening in august 
and get out and meet some people and go on a cool drive and things like that. So we're really excited to have that. Again, that's happening in August. You need to be a yep. club member. Go to the website to do that. Knock that out. Become a club member. Sign up for the drive. Get all the details. Yeah. So 2021 C4S and C4 Targa revealed. Yep. Thoughts on that? Love it. Yeah? I actually think they, this is the best the Targa has ever looked. Yeah. I don't I don't know if – I mean, it's definitely got to be qualifying because of the – the whole wide body but i don't know there's something that's like it's less glass this time around for the 991 even and it just looks good and the coupe line for the 992 has never looked better in every form they mm-hmm. just they've managed to keep it this time yeah i like it as well they always make these in low numbers obviously because they're pretty expensive cars yep um we found this out with the 991 generation obviously there isn't a lot of them they also made them in a manual mm in 991 they're going to make this in a manual as well you can option one in a manual um the one thing i did want to bring up with this though um it's you know it's tradition to have a c4s and c4 targa yeah 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 but there was a time where they made a c2 targa they had 964s c2 Mm. targas they they existed any reason why you think they're not making these in a c2 that's weird because they have a they're if they're gonna their c2 is gonna be the same body platform then Mm mm-hmm why yeah, why not have a c2 yeah and even if you didn't want to make just a c2 because they're just making a c4 without a c4s mm-hmm. maybe you just make a c2s yeah maybe just do li- because it's the, uh, yeah the yeah. upper mm-hmm. you know checked off package um it's going to be a quick car 443 horsepower same motor you know everything's the same for the 992 carrera s essentially in this yeah. car okay. it's just a targa um i think it looks great and i think this is kind of a sneaky car. We talked about this because we've driven the 992 and we like the convertible a lot. It mm-hmm. looks a lot like the coupe still even with the roof up. And we've described that, you know, in a lot of our YouTube videos. Um, if you guys haven't seen that, definitely go check out the channel um, during our review. But that howl that that they've the induction noise that they've yeah. been able to make with the car in the 992 is very GT esque. For sure. Are they doing a GTS model? Just, just... Um, they didn't say anything okay. about that. So maybe not, hmm. but usually that doesn't come out first, yeah, first, just, first okay. run. That'll probably come out later. Um, you know, maybe a couple of years in the, in the, then the line where they yeah. can have, where they patch together, basically the best of the best and put it all in one little thing. Um, do you think that, and, and we have a friend of ours that actually owns one of these an Emmanuel in the 991. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is kind of like a sneaky, sneaky pick without having to get a limited car these are almost where i'm going with this is they're self-limited yeah in the sense of like from from the point of the consumer not purchasing a lot of them Hmm. meaning like it's not manufacturer related for production numbers it's related to people just not buying a lot of them Hmm. now because of that and i always think this is an interesting topic to talk about because there's a there's a big debate between like okay well just because a lot of them weren't bought doesn't make it special because there's still few of them still limited yeah indirectly right Mm -hmm. and that's what i that's my argument that i try to make on that it's like it doesn't matter even though they only sold 1200 of them or whatever it is i'm just throwing that number Mm -hmm. out there just because only 1200 people bought one that's still that that's what the production run was just because porsche as a factory didn't say we're only making 1200 of these then everybody feels like they're unattainium and then they it causes this frenzy Mm -hmm. so it's kind of this un written thing where okay it it will make as many as you want but just a lot of people just didn't buy them do you still think that they're become collectors or special enough because of the the latter of that as opposed to the manufacturer not putting the gauntlet down when the consumers just buy very few of them does it make it special i think you'd still need to be a a target person i think at the end of the day i mean the market is where it's where it is when it begins but I mean, are, are people really like hunting down nine six four targas? Are they really hunting down any of the other? Targa the people models? in the know are the yeah. people that are in the know. Yes, they are because I mean they made so few of them. I think there was like less than two hundred of them that, that were made in the last run, in the nine six four. And they're really really rare actually. And then you get one in a special color, and then you end up getting like really one of one. But you can go down that rabbit hole. We all know how that goes. I'm just—I always thought it was an interesting debate. And there's always cars within the lineup. It, it, another perfect yeah. car in that lineup is prime example. It would be the Carrera T. Yeah. Um, 
the manufacturer would make as many as anybody wanted. But guess what? They're sitting. They were sitting in showroom places. People didn't want them. They're like, oh, I don't want them. I always find, you know, it's uh, over time. It takes time. You know, when these people buy these things secondhand, thirdhand, whatever, these become the ones that people want. Yeah, yeah five, just, just for the fact that 10, it's, yeah. 15 years later where they're like, yeah, I remember those. Man, I haven't seen one of those in like 20 years. I haven't seen one of those in 15 years or 10 years or whatever. Yeah, because they only sold like a 1,000 of them. Yeah. And not because they didn't want to sell 10,000 of them. They would have if people would have bought them, but only a 1,000 people bought them. So that's all they made. And um, I think they do. I think they still are special. And I think these are that sneaky pick is where I was really going with this without having to, oh, well, you got to get an allocation for one. Oh, you can't. You can't do that. You can't do this. You can almost do anything you want to one of these. Yeah. What do you think about python green and lava orange being like standard colors now? I like it, actually. Um, I'm... <sighs> That's a, it's an interesting debate. Like this whole, like, you know, the whole PTS talk where everybody wants a unique color and you want all these things and you want, you had to pay up. And I get from a manufacturing standpoint, when you don't run, for example, you know, you have 150 cars coming on the line today and you're going to run them all in GT silver. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, then you got, and then you have one Miami blue car in there. You got to pull it to the side or change whatever you got to change or Mm -hmm. press a certain button. I mean, I don't know the dynamics. I'm just talking to my ass. Even if you got to press a different button, you got to clean out the jets, whatever you got to do to make that happen. I know it's there's a transition in time which costs money for the manufacturer to make that happen. With that being said, nowadays with Porsche and how much they cost, I don't I don't really think you should be paying up at all on any of these PTS cars. I know it would be a total pain in the ass for Porsche just to offer you whatever color you want with mm. the par- price that you're paying. But I feel at that price point, I almost feel like you should be able to pick whatever the hell you want instead of saying, okay, well, that's a $20,000 premium on top of your one seventy that you're paying already. I mean, everything costs something. No, I get it. But does it cost $20,000 more for you to press a different button in the paint well, thing? Well, I mean, it might, it might, depending on how many people you have to employ or whoever, you know. Yeah, but I, what robot. I'm getting at is they want to put it on a price. It's almost like if you get private contracting done at your house. Mm. And you're like, oh, I want to get a, a bonus room put on in my house. And in all reality, with profit margins and everything like that, maybe it should cost fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to do. Guy quotes you forty grand because he's giving you the I don't want to do it price. Mm. I'll do it for you if you're dumb enough to pay forty for it, but I don't want to do it. I almost feel like that's how that's how it is with these PTS things. They don't really want to do it. But if you want to pay the twenty five, thirty thousand dollars to get PTS done, they're mm. like, fuck it, whatever. Yeah, you want to pay an extra thirty for to have that? You got it, pal. You know, and, and I like the customization from standpoint, I like people trying to be unique, but, and, and it it got out of control. Obviously we saw it happen. Yeah. I think it's kind of, and the last one with all the GT cars where everybody Mm. wanted to, well, I want an oak green flat. I want a matte oak green. I want oak green metallic. I want this, I want that. And I get it. You're spending all that money. You want the car to be unique to you. But I feel a lot of that stuff might not have even been their dream color. I think we talked about that where people were specking cars for just, resale. Just to be individual. For resale, yeah. Yeah, actually. Not even even yeah. reg- like individualism, almost just for resale, for potential high markup resale. To be like, no one's going to have this. And then next thing you know, there's three of them. <laughs> or four of them. Or five of them. And they're, all, and they're all for sale. So I know that was a roundabout way of saying a target is special, but I think it is a special car. I like the fact that these are coming in manual. Um, I and when we did test drive that target GTS that we drove the nine nine one, I really enjoyed the nine. best of the best of both worlds effect though. Hmm. That yeah, the short amount of time we did get to run with the top off, I could really really see the appeal of that. And yeah. I mean, if you had the, if you had a little bit more money, I, I I don't I don't know what the delta is between the convertible and the target, but. If you like that convertible aspect, I think that it almost all, it really does get that in-between coupe mm-hmm. convertible feel out of it. I agree. I agree. I totally agree with that. And the thing is, is there's a lot of people, and a close friend of ours has said it too. It's like, if you've never driven a Targa or never been in a Targa, you really don't know what you're missing until you've done it. And and I, hand up, I was guilty because I had never driven a Targa until we drove drove that newer Targa, mm. the, the 991. Um, and I really, really liked it. And I total like after we drove it i totally get it prior to that total honesty i didn't get them i'm like why would you want this this doesn't make any sense 
But after I drove it, I was like, this makes total sense. Yeah. I mean, it looks good and it's just as quick as you think it would be. Yeah. And I think the epiphany was, is you felt like you were still in a coupe, mm. but you weren't yep. because of the open air fit. You got the wind, you got the, the sensation noise. of speed, mm. you got a better sound because yeah. you could hear better a little, the exhaust a little bit more because the roof was off. Um, I really, I, I understood it a little bit more. Um, you just think. And, and and let's talk about a little bit for people that are listening that don't know the history of the target and why the target actually exists. Mm. Um, you know the history behind it, right? Uh, a little bit. Okay. So back when the target was being made, Porsche knew that America's, uh, specifically the U.S., not just North America, liked convertible cars. Mm. It was just a t- sign of the times in the late 60s. A lot of people just liked cars. Corvettes and convertibles, Camaros, muscle yeah, cars, all that kind of stuff. stuff yeah. All that stuff, people were buying those kind of cars. It's basically, what I'm getting at, sports cars with that were convertibles. Um, but they're also the DOT was coming in for regulations because basically all they were doing was cutting the roof off of these cars. There was no real balance and safety of these cars when they rolled over. Mm. People were getting killed. Um, so safety emissions were coming in. They're saying, Hey, we're just probably going to squash convertibles altogether. That was the talk of the town. Mm. So for all manufacturers, they were pretty much any convertible in their lineup was going to get nixed, which wasn't that big of a deal because they hadn't made a coupe version of it, but convertibles were a big seller back in the day. And they're still pretty, they have their niche market nowadays, but the roundabout way behind this Porsche was going to get away with it was okay. The essentially that bar goes across is a roll bar. bar. (laughs) And they still wanted to sell the car with an open air feeling. So they sent the engineers. They're like, this is what we need to do to be able to sell in the American market. How are we going to get away with making essentially an open air car without it being open air? And then voila, you know, cliff note version, the target exists target because of it. Up. Well, as we all know, that regulation never, never got put into play as far mm-hmm. as n- banning convertible cars altogether. Um, so they were allowed to still make the convertible. So that car was born out of anticipation of not being able to make the Cabrio, but now they were still able to make the Cabrio. So now they have another yeah. model of car that was being made in conjunction with their Coupe and Cabrio. So that was the birth of that car, and it's still around to this day. And thus begins the lines of Porsche. Yeah, so it's almost kind of just <laughs> born out of a necessity to sell an open air car. Yeah. Worried that they couldn't. Yeah. And they had, they figured the best way to engineer it the way they decided to do it was that. So I think it's pretty interesting to tell that story that for a lot of people that don't know that story, I know a lot of you already know that story, but there are plenty of people that listening in 84 other countries that might not know that story. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a very, very unique story. So the Targa Porsche is responsible for that, that design cue, that look for, that reason. Well, that makes all the sense that it has such, such rigidity and all that because of the glass and the roll bar that needs to be safe. And exactly. So very, very, heels. very, very interesting all the way around on that. Um, and I know you and I have talked a little bit about Targa's in the past as far as what gen you prefer and what you do. So you're saying the most recent one is what Not you prefer? One, please. <laughs> yeah. The one we drove, basically. Just one. I mean, just the the fact that you can hit the button and everything, and the cool mechanisms, how it goes away yeah. and stored. Fun fact: the the newer one actually puts the top and everything in a lot faster than the other one. I think the other one was okay. like forty two seconds. Yeah, it was something. This one's long. nineteen seconds. Oh. So get out of its See, way, because Mike. Okay, you're gonna get hurt. you're gonna get hurt. Unacceptable. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, this is taking too long. <laughs> Yeah, you're going to get hurt if you're in the way of this thing going on or off, essentially, because wow. <laughs> it's doing its business quickly. Um, I agree. I, I, I mean, not newer is not always better, but I do like the design cue on this one a lot, the new one. Um, I do like the one we drove as well. The one we drove was PDK. Um, I'd like to have a go in a manual one. Yeah. Just to see what it would be like to have the top off and have that manual effect and that how. Do you think you feel a difference in the weight more with the manual? It's hard to say because it's a heavy car already. Mm. I mean, and it's powerful. At that point, I can't imagine it being plus or minus maybe 200 pounds. And being plus or minus 200 pounds when a car it already weighs like probably in the upwards of like 3,700, 3,800. Mm. I don't know if you can really tell the difference, to be honest with you. Maybe if you if you, if you you lived with the car, probably 100% you could tell. But for us, spending a day with the car when we get like a 24-hour span, no. I don't really think that that's enough time to be able to tell the difference. Like I, f- I feel like that, that little bit of weight difference 
can't be told immediately unless it's in a lighter car. Meaning like you have a car that weighs 2,400 pounds and then it, then you have it weigh 2,700 pounds. I think you can feel that immediately yeah. because the car is probably under power where this car makes up for it in the power department where it's like has a robust engine where it says, okay, it doesn't really matter how much I weigh because it's a freight train. Yeah. So I think that's interesting. All right, so let's take a quick break, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about the uh, first Taycan Turbo that was wrecked. Yeah. Interesting. Make sure that you check out Soul Performance products because they are a sponsor of P-Car Talk. They have a great exhaust. Um, we were running it on the Turbo S. Um, it's handmade. It's made in the U.S., uh, made by Americans, uh, sold to everybody else in the world. So very few products are still made in the U.S., and they make exhaust products for every vehicle that you can think of, not just Porsche. So please check them out. They're a great sponsor of the show. Uh, we love their products. A lot of other uh, people that we respect as well as running their products on their car, and they're battle-tested, they're race-proven. If you're looking for a solid, quality American product, definitely check out Soul Performance Exhaust. Now back to the show. All right, we are back from break. And let's discuss the first Taycan Turbo salvaged. I, you know, I said wrecked. It is wrecked, but I mean it's no. so wrecked that it's at the Copart Salvage Yard, like so, Sarah's place, or no, like <laughs> you know, like that thing. It's down by us. It's just like oh, okay. all total cars end up. Oh, near basically. us. Okay, yeah. No, I'm not saying it is near us. I'm oh. saying it's like that yard. Oh, okay. Like these centralized salvage yards, basically. So nobody knows what it really is, and they're just kind of just there. I mean, it's on their um, website. You can oh. bid on it um, on Copart's website. So the interesting thing about this thing, I think what makes it really sell the story, um, is the car only has 15 documented miles on it. Brand new. So what in the fuck? How? I mean, we've driven that car. I know what they did. Like, I, you, can tell you, I can tell you in three seconds what they Please did. do. Tell me. Uh, tell me. Launch that. control. Okay. And they lost it. <laughs> yeah, but how do you... That I don't car, know. That car... Drive it itself. saves you. Yeah. It, it, if all the things in the world that you could drive and crash in total, this is the one I don't think that is. It's like, hard. I mean, it's hard to lose it because we drove we drove it pretty hard, and even like you turning it around at a yeah ridiculous speed. I mean, it's glued to the ground. Yeah, it was planted. You have four working motors essentially at every axle, and it's the car. His brain is consistently changing the dynamics of where it needs to put power so it doesn't lose grip. Um, so if you look at the picture of this car, it's on the left side, the driver's side of the car, the front axle and the rear, the wheels are like bent under, like folded under. Oh, wow. So it looks like this thing went into Still. a slide, uh, like a power slide or something, and then basically hit a curb and just like rip those two wheels down hmm. or something. Maybe that's what happened. Like somebody was trying to be cute and did a slide with it within 15 miles. But I think the alarming thing or the shocking thing with that is, okay, you take delivery of this car. 15 miles is not very far. Like yep. people run that for exercise routinely. So w within that 15 miles, wherever you took this to slide, I'm speaking to the person who owned this car or took delivery of this car and then crashed it and wrecked it for salvage. Mm. They screwed that up that fast, that quickly. Like how, how was that that possible? What? It may not even been... They, it may have had eight miles in the car when they got it delivered. Exactly. So, I mean, it could be yeah. even the less of mileage they put on it. Yeah, I don't know. It's... So, it, from the photos, it doesn't look that bad as far as salvage goes. And anybody listening who's maybe never had a car, it's been in salvage or, or even in an accident altogether. Because mm -hmm. we had a friend just recently of ours have never even been in a car accident. Yeah. Um, so it needs to be a high percentage. It needs to be almost the threshold. I think I, I want to say it's like, yeah, I think it was actually a little bit lower. I think it's like 70% oh. like hmm. damaged for re as far as the repair threshold. If Man, it's that 70, must be really expensive. Up that's front. what I was. Yeah. Ooh. That's where I was going with this because this car it now wasn't the turbo S, but it was still a turbo. Hmm. So, I mean, it's still 170, 80 ish thousand, depending on the way it was specced. So 70% of that, they're claiming that this car is probably damaged in it going to salvage, mm. which is shocking because that just shows you maybe, or maybe the insurance company, because no, not one of them has ever been fa that wrecked or anything like that. Yeah, Cause could, it's such a new car. They, can make an adjustment. they couldn't have made a proper yeah. assessment. So maybe they were just saying like, you know what? We're totaling the car because we don't even want to screw with going down the repair cost of this because we talked to Porsche and they don't even know how to repair this thing. Maybe that's what happened here. Yeah. My question was, I mean, I know dealerships are there for maintenance and stuff like that, but anything that happens to that degree where there needs to be like 
restoration does it does that involve like going back to germany at that point or maybe like, there's I not don't an know. independent that i'm right now i'm sure that yeah and that maybe a lot there. of these are just going to end up like this one in the salvage yard like almost a throwaway at that point point. and this could be a circumstance of where this car is bad timing too as far as the accident goes what mm. i mean by that is porsche wasn't really making a whole lot of cars so their factory is probably not up to speed to handle something that maybe all these components they need to do because they're still trying to pump out the delivery of these cars, yep. let alone saying, Oh, we need to make an extra fill in, fill in the blank mm -hmm. parts for this guy, Yahoo, who had his car yesterday Yahoo's. and then crashed it. Um, what do you think this thing would go for in a salvage auction based off of what, like the price of that, what that is. And now based off the percentage of what it takes to kind of salvage it's a car, it's an unknown I mean, maybe half the value. I so mean, still like it's still 90, worth, it's maybe, still worth something because there's still good parts on salvage. it. Salvage, still good parts on it. Oh yeah. So and it works probably to some degree. Yeah, it's probably so intricate though. Like as far as the battery you think, you think and one, all this stuff. You think stuff that one and, piece went and it's toasted? You think this thing's gonna end up on some? popular youtube channel of those you know i don't know yeah. you, you know i don't know them all by name because i don't really consume that many other people's content but you know it's either hoovy or tavarish it's one of those two well hoovy doesn't really work on oh, destroy yeah. there's a lot of other channels that yeah that have a lot of following that do this kind of like repair like they they go yeah. after these kind of cars to like on purpose to like work on them and I don't know the names of them and maybe some of our listeners watch them and it, you know the the name of the channels are are unimportant the point is is this is a big enough so named you do this? named you car yeah right project. big enough named car you know I love doing projects um, <laughs> named car where it could bring some highlight to the channel of the one of they those definitely places could. I so mean depending you, on what it auctions for yeah and I'm asking a big what if like what if you know, who cares, I guess, is is really what, is this thing even worth, like, replacing, I guess? That's all, I mean, I guess it's up to the person that, if you really wanted to see what And I guess about. maybe at a certain dollar figure, right, you have mm. to know what, where that, that threshold money is, where yeah. you can say, well, I can pick it up for 50, and then it's going to take me another 80 to make it right. And can or, they raffle a salvage title, and if they're going to raffle it, or they And are the parts it? of attainable? Maybe yeah. that's why it got junked anyways, because they just couldn't get the stuff. Maybe. Um, I just thought it was interesting to bring up because. Yeah, I mean, it's a good. I mean, you, you don't know what kind of backlog they're going to keep as far as the parts department for the Taycan, since they're not really, like you said, they haven't made too many to begin with. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure and, they're being pretty efficient with it. And I think that goes back to saying with, with cars in general, um, not that this ever deters anybody from purchasing a car or, or anything like that because if you want it you want it and if you have the money for it and you have the allocation you're going to buy it regardless but it's not a thought it up really enters your mind until something like this happens yeah but you know i'm sure this person probably waited for this allocation for a while oh, and then this happens the and it's like you can't this is why we can't have nice things because <laughs> you don't know how to like take care of stuff because you had it a, like, a day terrible. and you destroyed it um i wish it would have put the person's name out there so we could flame this person because I mean, come on, man, you basically wrecked one of the safer cars and totaled it. I mean, they, they would have had that Porsche like, makes like actually hydro, probably the safest car like that they hydro make. Land or something. It, it doesn't, yeah, but that car doesn't really do that. <laughs> it doesn't really do any. I'm like, it's, it's that's what I'm saying. Safe. It's like, you have to be acting like an asshole to have made this happen. This isn't something that was just kind of, even like you said, at launcher control, I, disagree with that like this car's not going to crash on launch control that thing was aero straight when we launched it over and over and over again Th this had to be some serious like foul play this guy was probably trying to do like a four-wheel donut thing or something with this car and it was not happy <laughs> it and just it was, corrected itself it's like i'm not spending anymore it's like i'm not doing this this is not what i was meant to do yeah um but yeah i if you guys hadn't heard that's this has happened, so it's interesting. Um, one down. Yeah. Limited values. One, one less out there for all you Taycan yeah. owners that have one. Uh, but anyways, it's interesting. Uh, I'm totally blown away by it, to be honest with you. Uh, what color was it? Was it white, I think blue? it was like basalt black or something okay. like that. It's a black car. PTS. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, PTS. It was, it was uh, anthracite with something with 
you know, whale skin in it. I don't know. <laughs> Something super rare. But anyways, um, so updates on my Turbo S. Some stuff wasn't working. I know I kind of talked about that. Yeah. PCM switch wasn't working. Seat heater switch is not working. So update on that. PCM switch was just a faulty switch. Um, yep. Was able to replace that switch. So now I could turn PCM off anytime I want, which is outstanding because um, I do need that interesting thing when we went down the wormhole the seat heater situation yep tell us about whoever it. had the car prior to me decided the seating the heat seating element and module was a maybe not for them or whatever reason there's no documentation i don't have any info on it but it is not no longer in the car that mm-hmm. is why those switches do not work so essentially they're just dummy switches they don't go to anything yes they are it did have heat seater when it left the factory Mm. but somehow between 2005 and that when i attained the vehicle now short time yeah only like a few years right Mm. um somehow the seat heater elements got pulled out of the car and and the the reason i was a florida car right yeah it was too hot i think and the reason why like my buddy Corey was looking into it and and the reason why he came up with figured all that out was cuz they still had to rig up the power seat portion because they're sport seats. Yep. So they have your power so, adjustable. Exactly. In order to send the heat, it still has to be hooked up to it. So they hooked it back up, but they rerouted from where the heat element was. So it was there was some it was p- done purposely. It wasn't like mm-hmm. just done by accident. Somebody took time to take that out. Now you know, the speculation behind it, who knows, fill in the blank why that was done now, who knows, you know, maybe they broke and they just didn't want to replace them. That's I don't true. know. Um, but all the stuff's out of the, did you ever look car. at, did you Google and see if there was any common, like the, those seeders breaking or, I mean, they fail. I mean, there's tiles in them. Like when people put their knee on it, you know, reach over to the other seat when you break the tiles on it, um, you know, they can get pricey to replace hmm. that could have happened. Maybe it was just I'll stop doing that. I put my knee in my seat like yeah. just recently. Yeah, that breaks the tiles, and they're actually pretty fragile, believe it or not. Um, so once they go, um, what will happen is you press the button, and you'll see it send a signal, and it will go red, and then it will turn off because it's not – the heating element won't take the heat properly because it knows it's, like I'm it's broken, damaged. It's not doing it. So it won't send it. You know, um, maybe on fire. So that could have happened. Um, the other thing is for whatever – I mean the car's heavy as hell, like – yeah, was like maybe there was like uh maybe they tried to save weight i was like what yeah, for the rest, yeah. i was like yeah. what they save like i don't know like hardly anything yeah. i mean with the module weigh like maybe five ten pounds at the most uh anyways so update on that um i also going to put a valentine one in it had to order a pigtail i didn't get that put in yet so that's happening i feel like you might be speeding <laughs> it's very <laughs> easy to be illegal in that car let's put it that way um, ordered some camber plates for the 964 um, because sure you did. it needs it. <laughs> yeah, it needs it. Um, also needs toe adjustment, obviously, camber and toe adjustment. Mm-hmm. So that's happening. Uh, no need to run ultra turn in race car for street since the tra- car gets tracked. He's been like, through a few set of tires. Yeah, so car gets tracked like he's been t- support Michelin two, or, heavily. two or three times a year, maybe. Um, yeah. Every time he sends me a t- he sends me a text, it's not been very long in between the texts. I was like, hey, yeah, I got new tires. You get new tires for the front front tires. again. It's like, golly. And it's like, yeah, exactly. So that's what's updates. What's going on in my car? You heard what there was going on with Aaron cars earlier. Um, so let's circle back to Porsche. Porsche news. Porsche has launched a new search engine for Porsche buyers to use. Um, this is searching new and used inventory within their uh, network. Uh, CPL them, cars. Taking, yeah. I guess taking PC out of the picture is that. Yeah. I don't know. I think maybe they're just wrangling in or their own. I think what it is, it's not even just PCA. I think what they're doing is, so this is within their network. So this is new mm. and used and CPO cars. So I think what this is, is they're wrangling in their dealership networks yeah. as opposed to, and now these dealerships are still going to allow, obviously not allow, but like they have their own postings on their own websites for their cars. Yeah. Cause they're individual. Like Exactly. Yeah. But I think mm. what, Porsche as a whole, like AG or North America or whatever it is, I didn't look into like if it's just North America. I know they had a search before, but I, yeah, maybe they didn't have all. So this the... is tying in all the dealerships now. Hmm. So you can find a car, for example, in Colorado Springs. And if you like the car and it's CPO'd um, and you don't have to go to the Colorado Springs site, you can just use the Porsche launch engine that they've hmm. developed and built 
Um, I think the more interesting thing about this launch of it is, and the details of it is, there's search parameters. And what I mean by that is you can go in there and say, I'm looking for a Riviera blue car. And if there's one anywhere, like you just click on that and like, essentially like any other search engine, you can really get down to the nitty gritty. You're like, I don't want to see any convertibles. I don't want to see any PDK cars. I want to see manual only. And I want to see this color. Where, where does that exist? And click search and then it's like basically like breaks it all the way down to just like two of them this is where they are and then you can look at those so it saves you a lot of time and energy as a as opposed to maybe traditionally using a broker calling dealerships searching for cars looking for their website so it's definitely streamlines a lot of things dealerships a little bit more friendly i guess towards each other yeah i think it kind of forces their hand right a little bit um but i think it also helps them too because this is an added benefit as opposed to um, a detriment. Well, yeah, because if you're if you're that dealership and you're the other dealership that's close by, hey, you know, mm-hmm. swap some cash, move some cars. Clearly, um, and it, and it also is just another another helping tool for the dealership network to sell cars. Is the way I look mm-hmm. at it, because essentially this is a Porsche funded thing. The dealerships didn't have to fund this. So even the dealerships, it's because some of them carry some classic cars too. That the, are those in there as well, or do you know? Yeah, I think so. And and I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to touch on that. So a well-known dealership in Colorado Springs, mm-hmm. um, they're known for carrying air-cooled inventory. Actually, um, that's part of one of their classic inventory, and they're actually one of the few Porsche dealerships. Now I'm not talking about an independent dealer. I'm talking about an actual Porsche dealership. Yeah that carries air-cooled cars. I can't remember the last time you and I went to a dealership and saw air-cooled cars mm-hmm. for sale Yeah, on on a showroom floor. I don't... And at any given time, they have anything from 10 to 15 air-cooled cars for sale. And they're nice cars. They are not... They're blue-chip cars most of the time. Well, you, know, you see a couple 930s for sale. Mm-hmm. You see nice 3.2 Carreras. You see a couple 964s. They sell good stuff there at that Colorado Springs, um, and you know they're not paying for anything on this. I'm just giving them a shout out just because of we enjoy them selling some of the classics yeah, cool. in their inventory. And and honestly, I, I wish there would be more dealerships, Porsche dealerships, not just dealerships in general, because there's tons and tons of third parties out there that sell nothing but classic air cooled inventory, and we love them too. Mm. But I think it'd be neat to see some of these cars at these dealerships even if it's in low numbers meaning like four or five um blue chip air cool in their used car inventory because there's no way that maybe one of their high profile customers doesn't walk in there and pick up one of their other cars that they're newer maybe modern water pumper cars and not see a 930 that's in very very good condition and have any you know they may have some interest in that car i mean i can see all i mean any of the sport classic uh, deemed dealerships, mm-hmm. they need to have some inventory of some sort in there, I would imagine. Yeah, but they don't, hmm. which is interesting. Because then, you, when you want to show it off, like, hey, this is what we could do. Yeah, I think I would think that too. But then you get into a whole another game of what they're doing, right? Now mm. they're selling cars too. You know, that's maybe something they don't want to go down the path of. You know, they want to leave that up to the dealerships. Um, but I think there. I mean, I think there's one in California that does it too. Um, I. The name, you know, escapes me at the moment. Um, I'm not saying Colorado Springs is the only one. I know there's, I know <laughs> the there's, I know one, there's yeah. other ones out there that may participate, but I know that they have a pretty solid inventory and it's a pretty good rotating inventory. It's not just a stagnant inventory of air cool cars that are like, you know what I'm talking about where you're like, oh, that car has been for sale for three years mm. in the same location and they haven't moved it. They are moving air cool cars con- constantly in and out of there for sale and people are buying them. Um, I think it is a very, very cool element um, that a lot of dealerships don't take advantage of Mm -hmm. that they should be taking advantage of because you can bring in a whole different type of clientele when you're selling those cars there. Um, And even if it's just from a a show of force saying, hey, we also carry these too, even though we sell a lot of new inventory, you know, you should have a classic as well. And you can be choosy with it too. I mean, you wouldn't have to carry everything. Of course, you can. Ca- and I think that's what Colorado Springs does. I think mm-hmm. they just pick the best of what they want to do as far as what they sell. And think about what that does for you as a dealership, because people, when it goes unwritten or unspoken, say I'm a high profile client and I have some older cars, but I don't really want them anymore. But they're mm-hmm. in good shape. 
and I don't want to go through the hassle of selling them, maybe you could consign them if you're my local dealer. Exactly. That's what I was thinking too. Like even or if, even maybe you, you were... would take them on trade. Like say I had a blue chip 930 and I just don't want to drive it anymore or I don't, I, I just don't want that anymore in my collection. And I want to get maybe say like the new GT3 and I want to use that equity that I have in that car towards that GT3. Can you do that as a dealership? A lot of these dealerships probably don't even want to go down that path because they just are so far removed from knowing what that mm. street value is on that car. As opposed to some of these other dealerships that are like, bring it on. Yes, we'll get you a new GT3. We'll get you an allocation. We'll give you 90 grand for that car. Yeah. And then we'll sell it for 120 or whatever. But the point is, I think there's a lot of dealerships are handcuffing themselves by not, not participating in that. I think it'd be cool to see our local leadership have, have a few 70s cars in there. I would love since, it. Since would, they started, you know, started yeah. in the 70s. I would love to walk into Reeves and see a yeah. 930 Turbo when they're for sale. I mean, it probably won't last very long because people, yeah. I mean. and, and buy it. But I think that's the thing, though, is because those cars do sell and they would sell quickly, how could you not want to have that a little, bit of, a little bit of a draw like displayed mm -hmm. i would want that displayed in my dealership you know even if you just had a used air cool I mean, it seems like i've never been to the colorado springs but it, from photos it looks like they have a whole dedicated area like a little area yeah. for just the the air cooled stuff in addition to the other side of the building you know they have all the new mm. water pumper stuff and all that kind of stuff um and at the end of the day i think people want variety i think your customer clientele people like new stuff but as we all know, as enthusiasts, Porsche people like vintage that, or mm -hmm. at a minimum, at least you're giving an education to people that don't know any better that are coming in. Yeah, we used to make these. Yeah. You're like, Hey, this is what that, that's what that turbo used to look like in the eighties. And like, Oh, that's so cool. Is this for sale? I'm like, yeah, it's for sale. I want this too. It's like, all right, cool. Package deal. Let's do it. Yeah. Turbo, um, turbo. Yeah. <laughs> get that turbo, turbo, baby. But, um, I, I, and, and just wanted to highlight them, and I'm using them as a reference point because I've been on their website very, very many times, and it's actually a very good website, and I've personally been hunting on their website for cars um, to buy when I was looking for cars, air cool cars, and even classic, you know, turbos or whatever, mm. and constantly I see they have a very healthy uh, inventory. When anything stick out at you, like, you're like, whoa, can't yeah, that's there. They had a, they had a, um, I don't know what the actual color code was it so i'm just going to call it cocaine white but then it had a bordeaux interior on it Ooh, and nice. i wanted that car so bad like white white with the red mm. it was just so good and it was so perfect and it had what um, was it was it? it was a 930 okay. yeah i think it was in it was at 80s i don't remember exactly what year it was a late year i think it was like 86 or something like that but it was nice it was really really nice car. It was very clean um it had, you know, totally the motor had already gone through like rebuild, all that kind of stuff. It was, it was stance perfect too. It wasn't slammed, but it wasn't like all wonky. Like it was when it left the factory, they mm. had brought the torsion That's bars probably, back down. Probably rest of the world. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was ROW. Yeah. Look, it looked on suspension. It was just a very well looked sorted car, but it also looked very like menacing at the same time. Mm. Well, of course it was. It's white on. Yeah. Right? I, I wanted that car pretty badly, but it was pricey. It was, it was out of my budget, but you know, I, I, I really remember that car on their website and I used to frequent there just to see the pictures of that car often just the, were the, the, like, were the freaks in white or were they in black? They were or? black. Okay. Yeah. It looked good. It looked really, really, really good. And, um, you know, I just wish more dealerships would do stuff like that. Um, I think it would bring in, cause I feel like a lot of the guys that are out there that are listening to us and that we're friends with actually mm -hmm. that have a lot of classic Porsches and that you can even call the 05 a classic essentially. Um, it's getting there because you don't see a whole lot of nine, nine sixes ever going to a dealership to get service because people are smarter than that. You know, they're going to an independent. I mean, the other side of things too, like if you had, if you were able to have somebody that's certified on air cold stuff, yeah, Porsche wise, exactly. That's a new line of servicing. Exactly. Um, and um, I, and I think it, what it, what it ends up doing too, it shows, a little bit more of your roots when you have something like that, I think in your inventory, maybe you have some older cars where you're saying like, look, we're enthusiasts too, you know, and not saying that you're not an enthusiast dealership if you don't carry those cars. But I think it almost kind of gives a visual presence of without you even having to voice it to say, this is what we bring to the table. Yeah. This is who we are. We love them. We we're very knowledgeable about them because 
and, and that, and you know, that actually, me just speaking of that gave me the idea of, unfortunately, a lot of people that work at these dealerships and, you know, I'm going to probably get a lot of hate mail on this and I don't give a shit. A lot of the salesmen at work at these dealerships don't know their ass from their arm. Um, because I've talked to guys at these dealerships that are salesmen. And now for every guy who doesn't know, there's also a salesman who's very in the know of stuff where you can mm. go and you throw a chassis number and you're like, Hey, you guys had a 964 up here the other day for, you know, that was in for service. It was this color. It was this, that, that. And they're like, well, what's a 964? And you're like, Oh my God. And then you look for the GM and you're like, can you fucking fire this guy? Like, yeah. please. Cause he doesn't even know chassis codes. Like he doesn't know anything. And to his detriment and not to support the guy I just bashed, but those guys are just trained on all the new stuff. They don't know Dick. They're just salesmen. Hmm. And that, and it kind of takes away from the enthusiasm of like, you're not really into it, man. You're just here to like sell these cars. You know, you're just, yeah, but then, that, then the other side is that, that how, man, how often are you really meeting the enthusiasts? Although I think for the most part, I'd say more you, often in the Porsche world would than say, you would yeah, in any other brand. Gonna say, I was going to say for the most part, Probably go sell actually. BMWs because they yeah. don't give a shit. They just want the badge. They don't know yeah. anything about it. Oh, you want the base three twenty five? Yeah, I just want a BMW. Sick, bro. Awesome, killing it. Does it come with cool shades? You got it. Like I don't know. I just I know I'm venting when in it package. comes to shit like that, and I know there's a business side to it, and I'm sure. And ideally, all these dealerships would love to have nothing but enthusiasts to work there, hmm. but unfortunately, it's a rat game too. So there's a lot of guys like us. And girls that are just like, fuck that. I'm not going to go sell cars for you guys. Like, you want me to do what? No. I don't give a shit about that yeah. damn thing. I'm not going to try to, like, swindle somebody out of their money to go buy that. But, um, and that's a whole nother ethics topic. But, anyway, we won't get into that. But you love everything Porsche, and that's all that matters. Yeah, right? <laughs> I just love the new shit. I don't even know anything about this old stuff. But, anyways, so, great show. Anything you want to add before anything we close was, up here? Uh, no. We talked about a lot. Yeah. Tons of stuff. Sweet. Well, we love you guys, and we'll see you guys soon, and we'll talk soon. See ya. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of PCAR Talk. Connect with us on Instagram at PCAR Talk or online at PCARTalk.com.